Welcome back. Uh, we've all settled down now. We've got ourselves our drinks of tea mainly, but one or two glasses of wine. But let me start first with the politicians. I'd like to ask both Edwina and Ken, in no particular order, why do you do it? Why are you politicians? I, I basically want to change the way things are. Um, I mean, from the earliest memories I have, I actually wanted to change things. I, mean, I remember my first job. I mean, even at school, I mean, I thought the school was badly run. I thought I could run it better. And uh, this has just been like a motivation. Things is a funny kind of word. Change well, things, the, change the I world, mean, the change way the people system. are treated, and you know, the way the environment's treated. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time saving the Natterjack Toad. I'd sort of go off with friends and we'd reclaim ponds that were being filled in. And it, I mean, it gradually dawned on me that I spent my life saving the Natterjack Toad, and some idiot bureaucrat would decide to build a, an airport on the Natterjack Toad site, which they eventually did. So I thought I should go and try and control the bureaucrats. I wish that was all you'd ever done. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save the Natterjack Toad, though. <laughs> well, the Natterjack Toads don't vote. Why, why do I do it? I, I do it in the end because of the kind of, uh, kind of commitment. And that came back in 1968. I was at, I was at college. And 1968, just like in many ways, uh, this year was, was a major year of change and of people thinking out what they were doing. Um, there was the Prague Spring when everyone thought, you know, it was great that people were sitting out there in the cafes and the streets of Prague and talking and arguing politics and they had free newspapers and free press and all the rest of it. And, and we all finished university, went off for the summer and the tanks came in, smashed them. And at the same time, we got, in that same year, we had got all the uh, disputes about Vietnam and we got flower power and we got peace people. We had got Danny Cohn Bendit and the people, the students on the streets of Paris, and I kept feeling that everything was going wrong. And if we wanted to do things better in this country, how should we do it? Well, you know, look at politics. I, mean, I was actually studying politics and trying to figure out what it was all about. And I thought to myself, I, I have to be involved. I, I actually like the way our country is. I like the fact that we vote and that we have free votes and that most people turn out to vote. And we can argue and discuss and we have a free press. And I know there are bits of restrictions, but on the whole, it's, it's free and it's there. And it has to be made to work. And if it has to be made to work, then it's got to be us, not waiting for somebody else to do it. It's the first time I've heard a right-wing politician talk about 1968 as an inspiration. Yes, but it was an inspiration of, of a negative kind. It was a feeling I didn't want that to happen to our country. Um, and you couldn't have my kind of background and not, not, f not flee from persecution and repression. And you could, I, I mean, I, I feel it this year as I watch the people in uh, Eastern Europe clutching their children to them, climbing over fences to try and get away. I think to myself, in a way, I wish they didn't have to do that. I wish they could stay and make their countries strong as we are. But that's very much harder for them to do it. And I must say, if I was in those countries now, I think I'd be clutching my kids to me and running like hell. He doesn't believe me. It's true. Well, no, it's interesting because for me, 68 was the seminal thing. Up until then, I suppose I'd been slightly anarchistic, very much into hippiedom and individual this and that and wandering off defending my Natterjack toads. And for me, 68 was seminal because every day I thought mm. something wonderful is going to happen. You saw Johnson being forced out of office in America with mm. the Kennedy-McCarthy mm. challenge. A do check in, in Czechoslovakia, the students driving de Gaulle out of France. And I thought... Any minute, one country's going to change and we're going to get a real democracy where really people matter. And I went through that year waiting for it all to happen and they all got crashed everywhere. And Con, Con Bendit, who you mentioned, said at the end of that, we must begin the long march through the institutions. And that, to me, I, I think was right. We weren't going to change it on the streets. Yeah, we well had I to get involved... And you, the only I thing with you, I don't think we're a wonderful democracy. I think we're bad. I could see that happening. Yeah. And I wanted to stop people like him and you, and we succeeded. Yeah. Uh, it seemed to me that the only way to stop people like that was to fight freely and openly and to yeah. appeal to, you know, the, the people and to say, look, this is what we argue about. This is what we disagree about. You choose. And they have but chosen. Isn't, the, isn't this the difference between politicians and other people? Other people can get ex as excited about 56 or 68 or 79 or whatever. Yeah but they can do it as lecturers, as journalists, as all sorts of other things without really just taking it on themselves that I am going to change things. I mean, this is, this is what self-selects politicians. They decide that they have a special quality to lead other people. Now, everybody gets excited in different ways <coughs> because 56, some people like David Owen, for example, who came from a fairly conservative background, moved left. 
some people in 45 moved left and others became conservatives because they thought it was terrible that Churchill should be thrown out. You have a dialectic there where people split up, but it's the, a certain part of the population decides, I can change the world. I'm better than the other 99 out of 100. No, I can change the world. It's not, it's not just like that. It's, it, it's a horrible feeling. It, it's a, a feeling when you're reading the papers and you, it, it suddenly dawns on you that somebody has to do it. It's not a sort of conceited, I, I will, I want to. But it is a conceit. Well, sometimes it's a dreadful feeling that maybe nobody's actually going to do this. Maybe you have to. Maybe you're the only person in the whole city of Liverpool that actually thinks that, you know, the Conservatives are right. And it may be something as trivial as a school debate or, or yeah. something, uh, an, an event, and, you know, you may be the only person who actually feels that way. And you, you look around, you wait for everybody else, and there's nobody else. You yeah, have but to you're do, a, you have you're no a lecturer. You could go on lecturing about it. Or you, yeah, as a journalist, you could go and cover events. You don't have to convert yourself into a politician to make a certain amount of impact. There comes, there comes a point for some people and there is no way of telling who it's going to be it can happen when uh, for someone like Corinne uh, uh, Aquino when her husband is, is killed that's happened to a lot of women who've become members of parliament when the husband has been a member of parliament and and suddenly he isn't anymore he's he's been elevated to the house of lords or he's, he's died or whatever and they take the place and uh, it's a, it's a horrible feeling that somebody has to and they're looking at you but there you isn't meat and people I mean that as you've met first MPs and cabinet ministers, thought, my God, I can do better than them. These people are awful. Isn't there an element not of that cabinet, in it? Not our cabinet ministers. Oh, come on, be honest. <laughs> you can it's tell yours. us. We won't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Just occasionally, you listen but, to somebody but there is an obsessionalism about it.